Well, good morning, everyone. I left Oklahoma City at 69 degrees, <laughs> and uh, I watched that thermometer go up and up and up as I kept driving south. I haven't quite figured this out. I, you're supposed to go north in the summer, south in the winter, and I haven't got that <laughs> figured out yet. Wasn't it great having Mark back with us after uh, six months? What a blessing. And uh, what a blessing to be with you this morning in the Word of God. And uh, finishing up the book of Proverbs. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think some of you had probably were thinking about buying a car when we started this, and now you've already sold that car after 200,000 miles, and here we are, Proverbs 31, uh, beginning in verse 14 this morning. Uh, we are looking at the, in a section beginning in verse 13, that talks about this woman's uh, itemized deeds. Uh, my wife says this is the uh, most convicting section of Scripture. And I said, I'm just grateful to God that they don't have the wise man in here. Uh, but if you do want the wise man, uh, it's in the Scriptures. It's Job chapter 31. And if that doesn't uh, burst your bubble, I don't know anything that does. What a remarkable wise man Job was, and it's very convicting to the life of wisdom and the life of faith. Well, Proverbs Chapter 31, beginning this morning in verse 14. Uh, and this begins our letter, what we would call in the acrostic format, the letter H. Uh, she becomes like a trading vessel. She brings her food from afar. Now, the uh, ability of this uh, woman is her skills in the kitchen, which uh, some of you have and some of you don't have. Um, that's what is emphasized here. So it's not a one-size-fits-all, believe me, and I try to point that out as we go through this lesson. Here is uh, the acrostic V or W, and she arises while it is still in the night and provides for her household, uh, household the quota or portion to her servant girls. Z is verse 16. She considers a field and purchases it from the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. And then this would be... Uh, Similar to the English H, again, it's a different word, a uh, different letter altogether, but as I said, 14 was an H, so 17 is an H again. Uh, she girds her loins with strength. She strengthens her arms for the task. And T is verse 18. She perceives that her trading is good, her lamp, uh, does not go out in the night. Why? Verse 19, her hand she holds to the double spindle. You may have distaff, a uh, good old uh, English word. It's the double spindle, so she is making the thread that she uses to weave. Her hands grasp the spindle. K, verse 20, her hand she spreads to the poor. She holds out her hands to the needy. L is 21. She is not afraid for her household on account of the snow, for all her household is covered in scarlet. M is verse 22, coverlets. Uh, that is bed coverings. 
coverlets she makes for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and wool dried in purple. So there we go from 14 to 22, and we'll see how far we actually get in our exposition this morning. So we begin with verse 14. Here is the H, and our attention immediately goes to the word becomes. And I hope you have been with me now long enough to know what becomes means. It's a word of transition. It's not one, it's not two, it is an arrow between one and two, moving, transitioning, transforming. That is becomes. And so think of, I've often thought uh, in my mind, why was Christ so patient with His men, His disciples? Uh, they're just a bunch of dummies. They can't figure anything out. They're running when they should walk. They're walking when they should run. They're opening when they should close. They're closing when they should be opening. And there's only one answer to that. He knew what they would become. He who began a good work in you will complete that work. It's the sanctification process. And we're all in it in one form or another. We're all being changed. And God in His providence is doing a mighty work in your life. And you are being transformed. And that is the word becoming. And it's so important. It's very important here because it emphasizes this wise woman's discipline. Yes, her discipline. Her steps to efficiency. She kept at it. She wasn't good at first. But she kept at it. She kept training. She kept working. She kept at the task and she developed a proficiency. So don't be discouraged at the beginning. Stay at it. Stay on it. Stay in it. It is what God has led you to and called you to. Don't give in to discouragement. That's what she is teaching us here. Look at the word like. It's a comparison. So she is like trading vessels, bringing the work of her hands to outsiders. And now she's formed a market for her demand. And now she's sought after. It doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come when you're young. If it happens when you're young, how many times do we see the youth with gift and talent and they, their lives are destroyed by it? Because that's all they've got, their gift and talent. They don't have a walk in wisdom. They don't know the eternal God that speaks to them about their life and the skill for living that life. And what do they do? They destroy themselves. We see it all the time. More personally to you, and I've talked with some of you, you have a gift. You have a real ability, a wonderful talent that God has given you. And you have said to me, there's no demand for me. I've, I've got this ability. I've got this skill. But there's no demand. And my answer was, and still is, be patient. God has given you that gift, that skill, that ability. Be patient. Wait. Now, I've thought about that. I've actually thought about your question you've asked me. And I've even got an illustration for you. Joseph, all of his life, could receive and interpret dreams all of his life. 
And those dreams always got him resentment or forgetfulness and uh, hurt and harm to him personally. The dreams had no demand. There was no pent-up market for the interpretation of his dream. Until, until the Pharaoh dreamed. You see, you don't know what your future is. You may have no demand for what you do today, but don't be discouraged. Stay at it. Develop your proficiency. And in the future, God has a plan and a purpose. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph because the Pharaoh created a demand. And one man changed the entire course of his life. That's my answer. Be patient. Wait for the Lord. That's not exciting. That doesn't, that doesn't pack seminars. You don't write books and have bestsellers with that advice. But that is the Scriptures. Here's line two. Brings her food from afar. Now her similar ability is in the kitchen. It's a catering service. A bounteous table now goes in every direction. People pay for excellent food. I used to live in government apartments right off Plano Road going to seminary. And they had this little restaurant uh, right next to 635. And they tried four different types of food. And it was a bust. Uh, I would try to frequent the places and then they'd get new ownership, and I'd go back and new ownership. And one day, I drove by. The building had been abandoned for some time, and there was a line out front. I grabbed Dan Duncan, my friend, and I said, you and I are going to go to this place. It's called Bobo China. And I had never seen a walk in my life and fire coming up out of the sides. And the place was packed. It had a line out front. That's what is happening here. People move where there is good food. Verse 15. If you have a new American standard, blessed are you this morning because you've got the best translation in the English language. You see, you have and, and, and in the text. No other translation in English does that. But that's all according to the original grammar, that little particle that we translate into and. I don't know what these other committees were doing, but they certainly weren't thinking about good Bible study when they came to verse 15, because we have these wonderful ands. Now, and, think of it this way, the proverb is the interstate highway. But you really want to look at this museum over here in this town. Like, I go by the Gene Autry Museum. When's the last time you've been to the Gene Autry Museum? Well, you have to exit I-35 to go to the Gene Autry Museum. Well, that's what these ands are. They're little exit points. And what they do is they bring us up close and give us detail to what we want to see up close. And here it is. And she arrives while it's still in the night. Here's the second exit. And provides food. That word food is literally what is 
torn. It's the picture of a lioness. She tears her food. Interesting. It's uh, the lioness in attack. Here's the first clause. Uh, rising early. While the household is at rest, she's at labor into the darkness before the dawn for the household, for the quota, for the portion of food for her servant girls. This verb to arise implies that she puts the needs of her household above her own personal comfort. See the phrase, into the night? That continues the image of the lioness who hunts her food into the darkness. Here's our second clause, and food. Again, torn. Let me give you that word, torn, because uh, I know some of you like to chase these words down. And here it is with a good reference for you, Psalm 111 and verse 5. It is the gracious covenant loyalty of our God who provides food. Now, I want to think about that for a second. How does he provide food? It's like uh, the lioness with initiative, with forethought, with activity. That's your God. He provides food. He takes what is torn and He willfully gives it to His people out of covenant loyalty. Now, why is that significant? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you and I are hearing through the media this soft atheism. Don't have enough water. Don't have enough this or that to feed the next generation. That's what is going on. It's atheism. <laughs> July 14th, 2023. We're still in July of 2023. July 14th, 2023, Baltimore, Maryland. The Vice President of the United States said this, if we invest in clean energy, electric vehicles, and reduced population. Ah. Now, reduced population. Uh, I'm getting in the reduced population age. You, you go to a clinic, you know, you've got these, uh, you've got these purple lights and this uh, soft music, and you just come down in this recliner, and we'll put that IV in, and uh, there you go. What a way to go. Uh, that's uh, one form of uh, reducing the population. How about abortion? How about uh, we deliver the child, we take them into a dark room, and then we go back and with counselors, we ask the mother, do she want that child to survive? That's what we're talking about here. So let's read it again. Uh, if we invest in clean energy, electric vehicles, reduce population, then here it is. Here's the catch. More of our children will breathe clean air and drink clean water. See, we don't have it. We don't have enough of it. And so, there we are. We're left on our own. i got news for you. Uh, the Lord God creates in abundance. And that's what He does because He said, on this planet, of all the planets, let there be life. And you know what? This world is teeming with life. One little seed from an apple creates an apple tree. One bear can eat 80 pounds of apples. This world is flourishing with life. So here's the question. Why is there hunger? Read the book of Proverbs. 
Proverbs 13, 23. Abundant food is in the uncultivated ground of the poor, but injustice sweeps it away. It's politics. It's decisions of men who rule over people. So let's counter that by thinking wisely together. Now, Joseph was a wise man. What did he do? What's he famous for? Feeding people. That's what he's famous for. How about David, the king? He took care of 400 men while he was public enemy number one. His face was on every milk carton in the ancient Near East. And in every, every place that you would go mail a letter. Wanted, dead or alive, David. And yet he fed 400 men, and that doesn't include women and children. He took care of people. Look at this wise woman, the second clause. What's she doing? She's feeding. She's providing for. That's what she's doing. Here's the final clause. And, and portions to her servant girls. She, in skill, takes care of those under her leadership and her stewardship. What do you have here at Believer's Chapel? You have elders and deacons that do what? They provide for you constantly. They're taking care of you. They're feeding the Word of God to you, and that is their major concern, to take care of you. That's wisdom in action. You're blessed to be a part of it. And so, in whatever way you want to cut it, it is the idea of goodness and generosity that is the heart and mind of wisdom. Here it is. Memorize it. Psalm 112, verse 5. Good will come to him who is generous and gives freely. That's wisdom. Who conducts his affairs with justice. Wisdom. 16. She considers a field and purchases it from the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. This is Z. She considers. What is that? That's a plan. That's a strategy for a field. Now she's looking at all the aspects. Moving boldly, she buys. You see that? Purchases. That's the execution of her plan. Line two, she purchases it from the proceeds of her other endeavors. My gosh, this woman is fully integrated now. She owns the land. She puts the cow on the land. The cow produces the milk. She takes the milk to your 7-Eleven and she puts it there in the air-conditioned aisle waiting for you. She's fully integrated. There's no middleman in the process. She has become a conglomerate by her skill and the work of her own hands. Amazing woman. 13, wool and flax. 14, the eating of her kitchen. It's now grown into a reputation and she's in demand. What did I just tell you? How do you become in demand? By waiting on the Lord. Trusting Him. Waiting on the Lord. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And He will intersect your life with your gift and your talent at the right time. And I just gave it to you. Joseph is your example. Don't miss that. So, here she is. Look at the word plants. Plants of Indian. Ah, oh, well, let's move on from that. No, I'm not going to move on from that. You know anything about the area of Israel? 
of all the places on the planet, God made sure that that was a rocky terrain. Loaded with rocks everywhere. Rocks six feet deep and eight feet deep and two feet deep and rocks right on the surface. Now, if you're going to plant a vineyard, my friends, you've got to remove the rocks. Let's start there. See, now everything's coming into context. Her digging for cultivation, hard labor, careful planning. Now, here's 17, the letter H. She girds her loins. That's the muscle group of the abdomen connected to the torso with the legs. But you already know that because we studied that with the rooster, the strutting rooster. Remember, that same verb is used, Proverbs 30, 31. The muscle group that connects the abdomen to the legs. And so with strength, she strengthens her arms for the task. Now, look at this word in the authorized King James gird. Everybody, everybody has a different translation. NIV, sets. ESV, dresses. NASV, surrounds. What, the word means to bind around. So essentially, tying around her waist, and thus she is strengthened. For what? It's the image of using her arms and her back. This woman of wisdom is not extolled for her beauty. That's what the world extols. The world chases beauty, but not the Word of God. Look at the picture here. She's strong. She is resourceful. She works. And thus strength is the image so putting it on, the idea is she preparing for some kind of action and activity. She keeps herself powerfully by girding. So now her arms and shoulders are, her back is fully engaged. She is praised in the book of Proverbs for her strength. That is wisdom. That's the skill for living. Her energy, her fortitude. It is Abigail, 1 Samuel 25, putting together a caravan of food on a train of donkeys to stop David from crushing. She, her servants, her farm, her land, because he was angry. And rightfully so. But she tempered all that. And David praised her for her good judgment and her wisdom because she worked hard putting all of that together. Verse 18 accounts acrostically to the letter T. She perceives that's, that her trading is good and her lamp does not go out at night. We open the top line with this word perceives. It is a wonderful word. You know, sometimes you get in and you start thinking about these words and the next thing you know, you're out and God is taking you some other place and you're seeing all kinds of things. This word perceives is so interesting. It literally means to evaluate internally. What you know internally. That's perceives. And uh, let me tell you where it's used. It's a wonderful, wonderful passage. 1 Samuel 14. There is so much in 1 Samuel 14. You have uh, an earthquake, and you have Jonathan taking that earthquake as a sign that God is ready for the Philistines to be attacked, and so he does. And here he is by himself with a shield bearer. Now, that's the job I want. 
I just stand there and hold the shield. But here's Jonathan. He's out here wielding the sword and he's cutting them up one after another after another. And then he goes through the forest. He's tired. He's exhausted. What's he been doing? He's been killing men. He sees a honeycomb. Puts that honeycomb into his mouth. And what do the Scriptures say? His eyes brightened. That sugar hit his system. And boom, he was a new man. Then he comes across the soldiers of Saul. And what do they tell him? Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, Saul put everybody under a curse that would eat today. And what are, what are you guys doing? Well, we're out fighting the Lord's enemies. And so Saul takes his army and he doesn't want to feed them. Uh, but he, he expects them to be engaged in activity and be at their best, but not to eat anything. And you know what? You know what Jonathan, the great Jonathan said? My father troubles the land. He troubles Israel. <laughs> now I got to thinking about that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've seen that word before. Yeah, that is the word that's used in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. And that's a fascinating verse. Trouble. Troubling the land. Because that's what Ahab said about Elijah the prophet. You trouble the land. Now... It's the clash of two worldviews with the same word. You know what you're talking about, Ahab? You're talking about having life on your own terms. You're talking about King, Mr. King, doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, and be answerable to no one. That's why you despise me and think that I trouble the land. I am the prophet of the living God. It's not me that troubles the land. You trouble the land because of your wickedness. Same word. Two worldviews. Fascinating. Well, that is our word perceiving right here from the book of Proverbs. Study Proverbs and you're learning the Bible. Trading. It's productive. It's gain. Good. Very common word in the Old Testament. Beneficial, desirable, valuable. Line two, her lamp. King James, candle. It's another image displaying something different than being a workaholic. Day and night labor as a regular course. So, is that what the virtuous woman is? She's a workaholic? No, not at all. Um, let's remember the Word of God when we think about these Proverbs and we apply wisdom to our life. What does the Bible teach? Psalm 127. The Lord gives sleep and rest to those He loves. David says in Psalm 3, in verse 5, I praise and worship God because He did what? He gave me rest. So what is this? This woman. Uh, what is going on here? If this isn't being a workaholic, what is this? This is her regular routine. She just starts the day like the lioness. Early in the dark of the morning, and that's when she provides food. It's her regular routine. It's not anything other than that, and we should appreciate her for the skill that she has, and the calendar that she has, and the 24 hour clock that she has. God gave it to her, not necessarily to you or to me, but to her. And this is what she does. Verse 15. So she's rising up before the sun into the dark. 
And it is her efforts into the night. Notice the description of a lamp that does not go out. The image depicts not being a workaholic, but something entirely different in the ancient world. It depicts prosperity. That's what it depicts. A lamp that burns all through the night. I had a business partner, a very wealthy man, and his wife was a Christian. And she kept all the lights on in the house all night. And that was what she was known for by everyone in the neighborhood. That's this woman. The prosperous home burns oil all through the night. Here is 19. The acrostic letter would be parallel to our Y, which is the beginning letter for hands. Watch her hands from here on because they're prominent in all that she does. I was, uh, I was being waited on by a waitress that I knew by first name and just having a casual conversation and I said to her, well, what's your plans for the weekend? She said, do you really want to know? I said, that's why I'm asking. She said, I'm changing the water pump in my husband's diesel truck. <laughs> I wouldn't know what a water pump looked like if it hit me in the face. And I said, I just praise you. <laughs> and from that point on, every time I went into that place and I had a group of Christian men, I called her over and I extolled her for the virtue of what she could do. Her father taught her to be a mechanic as a little girl. And I said to her, I want you to know how much I admire you for that. That's wonderful. That's fabulous. She would turn scarlet red. No one's ever said that to me. I'm saying it to you. That is this woman. This is a new section. We, we're not talking about her production. Here now we're talking about her technical know-how and how she does it. She does it with her hands. And she does it with a double spindle, making not only the thread, but then the elements that she wants to make with the spindle. And her hands grasp the spindle and notice the repetition of hands emphasizing her talent and her energy. Her hands grasp the spindle and the spindle whirls. Now, I'm going to stop at 20. I've got f five minutes, and I want to give you a word of wisdom. Nothing to do with a virtuous woman, but everything to do with wisdom. In the oil and gas community in Oklahoma City, that's a very, very small town in a lot of ways. Everybody knows everybody. And there is one prominent guy who went in for minor surgery. Minor. Everybody does that. Don't worry about it. No big deal. And he had a complication which led to another complication, which led to another complication. And when our Friday morning Bible study got the word, it was, would you please pray? We need a miracle. He's on a respirator. And he died. 
I knew him, not real well, but I knew him on first name. A big oil finder. He had a lot of success finding oil as opposed to natural gas. South Texas, across Louisiana, and even into Mississippi. He was a big hitter. He had a home close to the country club, not very far away. And that home was constantly under construction. A new room here, a new wing there, a big red brick fence for the backyard. It was beautiful. It was glamorous. There's no telling how much money he put into that house. And of course, we all know the answer, don't we? What did he leave? He left it all. I read his obituary. The oil and gas community in Oklahoma City was stunned. I mean, stunned. It took your breath away. You can't believe it. He's 61 years old. His obituary, what his family wanted you to know. He enjoyed drinking brandy with his friends and having late night cigars at the club. He wanted you to know that. I scrubbed that obituary three times looking for some scintilla of a Christian testimony. It wasn't there. But you're here. You're here right now. Here you are under the Word of God. Here you are in the book of wisdom. The book has a thousand ways of reaching you about your life this way and that way. Think about it this way. Think about it that way. From heaven above through the mouth of Moses. The only psalm he wrote, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The community is in shock. God's Word is the truth. Live every day as your last day. Every day is a gift. Every day is answerable to Him. Howard Hendricks, our professor, Mark's professor, mine, Dan, he used to say, gentlemen, live your life that at every moment you could be catapulted into the presence of Jesus Christ. Jim Elliott, Spirit in the River, by the Alka Indians. They thought he was going to eat them. Came to bring them the gospel. Jim Elliott said, live your life in such a way that all you have to do is die. You do that. You leave nothing for the world to have. Because it's all here. And it's all there. That's what I wanted you to hear. Wisdom is taking place every tick of the clock, every calendar day. Teach us to number those days that we may take this skill and apply it to our hearts. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and mercy to us each and every day in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Believer's Chapel and the leadership of this church that takes this gospel and makes it paramount from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. It is Christ, Christ in us, Christ on us, Christ through us, it is about Christ. There is such a gap between 
us in you, Father. But that gap has been bridged by Christ Jesus. That is what we believe, and that is what we will die believing. And there is now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. We do not fear death because we will be instantly with him. We praise you. We thank you. We extol your name. In Jesus' name, amen.